Well, thank you very much, Nigel, uh, for this introduction. I'm going to talk about cardiac screening. Um, and before I do so, I'll just give you an idea of my objectives. My objectives are to provide an overview of sudden cardiac death in athletes. I will then compare the effectiveness of currently accepted screening models and hope then to provide an appreciation of the developments in ECG interpretation that have gone, that have gone on over the last decade or so. But let's start with sudden cardiac death in athletes, the dreaded complication or the paradox of exercising individuals. We know that exercise has multiple cardiovascular benefits. People who exercise regularly have a satisfactory blood pressure and lipid profile. They're less likely to be obese and have diabetes. And by controlling all of these acquired risk factors for coronary artery disease, they reduce their risk of a sudden death from a heart attack by 50% when they're in their fifth and sixth decade. It's also well appreciated that athletes live between three and seven years longer than sedentary counterparts. And in this regard, young athletes probably epitomize the healthiest segment of our society. These individuals are role models. They astound us with their physical excellence and stamina and are a source of aspiration and inspiration to our youth. But very occasionally, one of these young individuals dies suddenly, and unsurprisingly, such events are usually highly publicized by the media and capture the hearts of the entire nation. The good news is that sudden death in sport is rare. If we look at uh, the, this slide, if we go from the youngest age group, age 13 to 17, all the way down to 30 to 65, you will see that in schools, uh, the incidence of sudden death is between 0.5 and 1 per 100,000. If we then look at the real business end of athletes, the sort of people that you deal with on a regular basis, the top Premier League type individuals or the league players aged 14 to 35, the incidence of sudden death is around 2 per 100,000. If we then move on to the individuals with, in their um, marathoners, for example, where the mean age is around 42, the incidence goes up only a little bit to 2.2 per 100,000. And then if we start focusing on joggers in their fifth and sixth decade who are not always conditioned, that then goes up quite steeply to 13 per 100,000. But I'd like to focus on our competitive athletes, the sort of athletes that capture uh, the hearts of the nation and the sort of people that we do screen uh, regularly in many institutions. Here are the facts. The incidence of sudden death in young athletes is 1 in 50,000. And if we look at European meta-analyses, the mean age of death in these athletes is 23 years old. It's important to emphasize that 40% of athletes that die are of high school age and aged 18 years old or under. There is a huge male predisposition with a 9 to 1 ratio in elite sport and 20 to 1 ratio in recreational sport. Now, this particular predisposition cannot just be accounted by um, participation rates. There must be something else going on that makes the male more vulnerable to exercise-related sudden cardiac death. Data from the United States also shows that black athletes are eight times more likely to experience an exercise-related sudden cardiac death compared to white athletes. 90% of all these catastrophes occur during or immediately after exertion. And what's very concerning, and that's where screening becomes quite relevant, is that in 80% of cases, sudden death is the first presentation of an underlying cardiac problem. When we look at the causes of death, the vast majority of athletes that die from, uh, that experience sudden cardiac death, usually die from hereditary or congenital abnormalities of the heart, such as the primary cardiomyopathies, which include hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and arrhythmogenic white ventricular cardiomyopathy. Until the past two years, we believed that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was the commonest cause of exercise-related sudden cardiac death worldwide, but there has been a shift in paradigm over the past two years or so. Amongst the Italians, where there is a screening program, arrhythmogenic white ventricular cardiomyopathy is the leading cause of death. Deaths may also be due to hereditary or congenital abnormalities of the coronary arteries or the aorta. Congenital abnormalities of the coronaries include ab uh, abnormal origins of the coronary arteries. For example, the left coronary artery originating from the right sinus of Valsalva or vice versa. 
as the artery goes on to supply the appropriate myocardial territory, it sometimes becomes sandwiched between the pulmonary trunk and the aorta, and during exertion, these vessels are distended. They can squash the artery and cause arrhythmias. Familial hypercholesterolemia has a prevalence of 1 in 500, and in athletes with this condition, sudden death is often the first presentation. And then you've got, basketball, you've got Marfan syndrome patients who may make decent basketball players who, again, have abnormal media of the aortic root, and they can develop aortic root dilatation, dissection, and rupture. Of course, sudden death may be due to electrical faults of the heart, notably the ion channel diseases such as long QT syndrome and Brugana syndrome, or congenital electrical accessory pathways such as the Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. And in these particular cases, the pathologist doesn't see anything and the cause of death is often ascertained. We only find out that these deaths are due to ion channel diseases because when you screen the family members of the victim of sudden death, you find evidence of something genetic wrong in around 50% of cases. People who have these conditions, certainly athletes and, and exercise, are three times more likely to die compared with a sedentary person who has these conditions, suggesting that exercise is a trigger for sudden cardiac death in an individual who already harbors an abnormal myocardial or electrical substrate. And the superadded complications or stresses of exercise, such as dehydration, adrenergic surges, electrolyte imbalances, and acid-based disturbances may culminate in a fatal arrhythmia in someone who is already predisposed. I've already told you that we know what causes sudden death, and we know we can diagnose it. Although sudden cardiac death is rare, the number of life years lost by these victims is multiple. Most people lose three or four decades of life, and therefore we believe that something should be done to identify young people who may be at risk. Certainly in, the Amer in America, the AHA, and here in Europe, the European Society of Cardiology, advocate some form of cardiac screening to identify asymptomatic people who may be at risk. The important thing to remember is that it's not just one condition that causes sudden death in sport. There are multiple conditions. That means that no single screening test will cover all the potential causes of sudden death. And if we add in, every time we add in a cardiac investigation, the cost of screening is increased and suddenly becomes prohibitive when one considers that the incidence of sudden death is only one in 50,000. So we need to find a cost-effective screening model, and there are currently two models available. There's the American model that relies on a health questionnaire pertaining to cardiac symptoms, a family history of premature cardiovascular disease or sudden cardiac death, and then, of course, examination, looking specifically for hypertension, valvular heart disease, evidence of coarctation of the aorta, or the Marfan phenotype. In Europe, this follows data from Italy, which I'll allude to very shortly. We do health questionnaire and examination, but we also incorporate the 12-lead ECG. Now, as things go in the United Kingdom, certainly if we look at the elite echelons of sport, if we look at the Football Association, Rugby Union, Rugby League, Institute, um, English Institute of Sport, uh, the Sky Cycling Federation, all of these big organisations all uh, recommend a minimum of ECG screening on an annual basis. Clearly, we want to extend this out to grassroots sport, where death is much more common than in elite sport. But what about the role of ECG? We know that ECG already picks up electrical faults. And the ECG may be more pertinent than we once believed. Here is data from 514 deaths in the National Collegiate Athletic Association athletes, where 79 were due to cardiac problems. And at autopsy, 25% of these athletes had a structurally normal heart, suggesting that they died from one of these electrical faults of the heart that can't be detected at post-mortem. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy only made up 8% of all sudden deaths. Here's another paper that will be out very shortly. This is a meta-analysis of sudden deaths in people aged under 35. Not all of these were athletes, but they accumulated 4,605 subjects. They found that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy only made up 10.3% of all sudden deaths in this young cohort, whereas um, a structurally normal heart was present in over a quarter. 
And in fact, when we looked at deaths in athletes, there was no death between the number of deaths with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and those with a structurally normal heart. And the take-home message is that electrical faults of the heart may be much more common than previous post-mortem data led you to believe, and that may support uh, ECG screening even more than before. Apart from picking up electrical faults, the ECG is good at raising suspicion of cardiac disease. This is certainly just our work, where we looked at 357 consecutive athletes, mean age 29, 92% were male, 69% were competitive, and we found in the red pie chart, 42% had a structurally normal heart. The ECG picks up cardiomyopathy as well. It's not the diagnostic test for cardiomyopathy, but it certainly picks up people who may have a cardiomyopathy because 95% of people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and between 40 to 50% of people with arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy also have an abnormal ECG. ECG changes that are relatively sensitive to diagnose hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are infralateral T-wave inversion, ST segment depression, and pathological Q waves, whereas the markers of arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy include anterior T-wave inversion in leads V3, V2 to V3, or even V4, with an isoelectric J point, epsilon waves, and multiple ventricular extrasystoles on a single 12 lead ECG. Here is data from Italy. Italy is one of the only two countries that mandate screening. The other country is Israel. Italy have an over 30 year experience where every single competitive athlete that, that, that is involved in organized or individualized sport undergoes an annual assessment. And this is their experience from screening 33,735 competitive athletes. Their disqualification rate is unacceptably high to be quite honest, and we don't quite do this in the UK. They disqualified 1.2%, but that's not what I want to really emphasize. I want you to emphasize that 3% of people that were disqualified were disqualified due to a diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The question is, how was this diagnosed? Because they all did, they did history, examination, and ECG. And so of the 22 cases of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy diagnosed, three were picked up on the fact that there was a family history of this condition. Two were picked up on the basis of a cardiac murmur. But 73% were picked up on the basis of an abnormal 12-lead ECG. So the American Heart Association model, which involves just a health questionnaire and physical examination, just importantly for those of you that are practicing this only, is cheap, it's pragmatic, but it's got poor sensitivity because 80% of athletes have no symptoms at all. And although as a cardiologist I am in love with my stethoscope, most conditions that cause sudden death in sportsmen do not tell any tales when you put the stethoscope on the chest. And here, is, here are two review articles that I can direct you to, which are very, very decent papers that have shown that, based on 47,000 athletes, the ecg has a 74 a 94% sensitivity to detect cardiac disease versus only 20% with history and 9% with physical examination and if you look at these specificities uh, you'll see that this is quite important in fact the ecg and i've always believed this has a lower false positive rate than history and physical examination in experience, inexperienced hands for example if you're seeing an athlete and you asked 120 of them, do you get chest pain? And you didn't know what you were talking about. You might find that 13 say, actually, I do. Just around here sometimes when I'm pushing weights. That usually doesn't mean anything. But if you didn't know your cardiology, you may be investigating these people. Or you get an asthmatic which says, actually, I do get much more wheezy just at the end of exercise. So I think you need this in inexperienced hands. History and examination has higher false positive rates than the ECG. The big question, and this is contentious, and even I say that as a screening antagonist, does screening actually save lives? And I'm trying to give you a balanced talk. Well, best, the best data on whether screening saves lives comes from Italy. This is based on 42,386 athletes from the Veneto region. The Veneto region makes up 11% of all the top Italian athletes who are all screened with history, examination, and ECG. During this 25-year period, there were 55 sudden deaths in sportsmen, and around 260 deaths in unscreened sportsmen. And the Italians report that ECG screening reduced their death rates from 3.6 per 100,000 pre-screening all the way down to 0.4 per 100,000 
following screening. This is a 90% reduction in sudden death, and they claim that these reduction in deaths was mainly from early diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. And many of you have seen this graph. This graph shows you death rates in athletes in the red line and non-athletes in the yellow line. And you'll appreciate that in the non-athletes, death rates have not changed at all, around 0.75 to 1 per 100,000. Whereas in athletes, they've come down steadily all the way down to 0.4 or 0.5 per 100,000. Now, the first point that I want to make, being a fair sort of person, this, was, this, is, this wasn't really a trial. This was an observational study where they noted that there was a re reduction in sudden death. They didn't compare athletes who were screened versus athletes who weren't screened. If you were going to do this properly, you'd have to compare screened versus unscreened. But if we look at sudden death rates of 1 in 50,000, I think someone like me would have to be absolutely sure that will make it to my 80th birthday before I could conduct a trial of this magnitude. The other thing is that if you look at death rates in Italy when they started, there were 3.6 per 100,000, which is far higher than any other country has reported. Roughly the death rate is around 2 per 100,000. So they may have just started screening at a wrong time. Had they started here, they wouldn't have demonstrated much of a difference. The Americans, who are completely against ECG screening, compared death rates in the Veneto region with those in Minnesota between 1993 and 2004, these are geographically similar areas, and they found no significant differences in sudden deaths in Minnesota, where athletes are ex tested only with history and examination, versus Italy, where they're screened with history, examination, and ECG. But I should warn you all that the data from Minnesota was collected from search engines, whereas the data from Min Veneto was, co was collected through systematic registries for sudden cardiac death. And even then, if you look here, although the numbers look similar, the death rates in Minnesota are still twice as high as in Veneta. The Israelis showed exactly the same. This is where they started their screening program here, just after this peak of sudden deaths in, in Israel. They compared sudden deaths 12 years after screening versus 12 years before screening, and they found no difference in sudden death rate 12 years before screening versus 12 years after screening. This is, sounds ominous and worrying, but again, these data were comprised just from clippings from two newspaper journals in the whole country. This is how this data was derived. We had no idea of the denominator of athletes. There was no autopsy data. And I try not to cite this as study whenever I write review articles because it really was very shoddy. So the best we've got is ECG screening. And I need to now allay your fears about ECG screening. The fears are that, that sudden death is rare. Should we really be spending all this money and causing anxiety to our athletes? There is a concern about high false positive rates because people who exercise do get ECG changes that may overlap with disease. There are concerns about false negatives and Fabrice Mwamba is a living example of someone who was screened and still underwent a cardiac arrest. There is the cost issue and many other issues. Let's talk about the low incidence of sudden death. There is no doubt that sudden death is rare, one in 50,000. But the aim of screening is not to pick up someone who's, 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 who's dead, they already died, it's to pick up someone who might die. And if we look at screening uh, programs all over the world, whether you look at Australia, the UK, the Netherlands, America, then if you look at the prevalence of conditions that actually cause sudden death in athletes, the figure that comes up again and again is 0.3%. So ladies and gentlemen, there are one in 300 athletes in the UK at the moment that have a condition that could potentially cause a sudden death. And the reason why death rates aren't as high as you'd imagine is because fortunately most of the conditions that do cause sudden death in athletes have a low adverse event rate. For example, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has an annual adverse event rate of between 0.5 and 0.8% per annum. Long QT syndrome has an annual event rate of around 0.2% per annum, and that's why death rates are lower than you would anticipate. What about high false positive rates? This is the body of the talk. We know that athletes get two types of changes when they exercise. They get vagotonic changes, such as bradycardia, AV block, and repolarization anomalies, but they also show evidence of chamber enlargement in the form of, form of Sokolov Leon voltage criterion for left ventricular hypertrophy and incomplete right bundle branch block. These are all normal findings in athletes, as I'll highlight now. This is the ECG of an Olympic medalist rower, and you'll see that he's got sinus bradycardia at a rate of 45 beats per minute. 
He's got right axis deviations, suggesting that his right ventricle may be a bit enlarged. He's got voltage criterion for left ventricular hypertrophy in isolation. By that I mean there are no accompanying ST segment depression or T-wave inversions in the lateral leads. He's got incomplete right bundle branch block. And he's got an early repolarization pattern. Now you can look at these, there's multiple <coughs> abnormalities. And if, if, if this sort of thing is performed by an inexperienced individual, you can imagine the number of false positive rates. So I strongly believe that athletes should be investigated by, ex, uh, by sports places where they've actually got link to experts who can actually look at an ECG very quickly and say, you know, there's nothing wrong with this ECG, as opposed to people doing it independently, or people doing it independently need to come on courses to make sure they know what they're doing before they start interpreting these ECGs themselves. The ESC in 2010 provided recommendations that helped people like me and you differentiate normal from abnormal. They had group one changes, which are normal, first degree AV block, LVH, sinus bradycardia, and things that were abnormal, T-wave inversion, ST segment depression, pathological Q-wave, bundle branch block, and many other things that are abnormal. And I'll go through some of these slowly. Because people who exercise actually vary in their demographics. They vary in terms of age, sex, ethnicity, type of sport, and intensity of sport. And all of these factors have a marked influence on what someone's ECG will look like. <laughs> Let's go back to the ESC uh, criteria. These ESC criteria, which were very pragmatic and uh, certainly well cited, have very high false positive rates. And there are two main reasons for this. Firstly, the data were derived from a purely white population. It's, in Italy, there were very few blacks when this data was conducted. So all the data came from white athletes. That's point number one. Point number two, the vast majority of people that were investigated in these studies were entering athletics for the first time in their life. So these are an unselect group of athletes. Things are quite different in the United Kingdom. 20% of our athletes are African or Afro-Caribbean. 20% of Team GB in 2012 was black. And the top sort of athletes that get tested in this country are very highly trained in exercise for 12 to 25 hours per week. And it's for this reason that, there were mul that EC the ESC criteria are associated with multiple false positive rates as reported by many, many studies. And that's because they regard T-wave inversion as abnormal. That may be abnormal in a white athlete, but that may be normal in black athletes. Here is data from our group by Michael Papadakis that compares ECG changes in black athletes in the blue bars and white athletes in the red bars. And the first thing I want you to note that hard, most of the things that you look at is higher in the black athletes than the white athletes. But the specific thing I want to draw your attention to is the inverted T waves. T wave inversions are much, much more common in black athletes than in white athletes, but T wave inversion also overlaps with the ECG pattern in cardiomyopathy. Specifically, T-wave inversion is found in almost a quarter of black athletes, but this specific pattern, T-wave inversion in the anterior leads in V1, V2, V3, V4, that is preceded by convex ST segment elevation, is present in just over 12% of black athletes. This is the sort of ECG that you would see in Mo Farah or Yaya Toure or Jermaine Defoe when we see this. Uh, this usually doesn't mean anything. I'm not just saying that as a throwaway comment. This is data relate based on multiple uh, studies that we've performed, investigating these guys comprehensively and following them up for several years. Then you've got this group of changes, non-specific changes, such as left atrial enlargement, right atrial enlargement, and axis deviations, which on their own don't actually mean anything at all. And of course, you've got the criteria for long and short QT interval, uh, which are very conservative with the ESC recommendations. So these non-specific changes make up 53% of all false positive results, and QT abnormalities make up 6% of all abnormal results. So myself and many, many other people like John Dresner got together in Seattle uh, three or four years ago, and we came back with a revision of these ECG criteria where we regarded T-wave inversion in leads V1 to V4 as normal variance in black people. We considered T-wave inversion in leads V1 and V2 as normal in all athletes. We, we created less conservative markers for a short QT interval of less than 320, of a long QT interval of more than 470 as abnormal in males, and more, I should say, more than 480 as abnormal in females. 
and criteria for right ventricular hypertrophy also included right axis deviation. These changes were associated with a significant difference in false positive results without compromising specificity. And if you look here, you will see that the percentage difference varied from nearly 50% to over 90% when you compared false positive results with the ESC 2012 recommendations versus the Seattle criteria. So major advances indeed. But even then, I did have a gripe about these because the Seattle criteria did not include incorporate these axis deviations and atrial enlargements. They, they included these as abnormal, yet our practice here over 18 years suggests that these alone don't mean anything. So it took us 10 years or so to publish lots of papers, and I'm not going to go through them all again and again and again, but these are all evidence-based data in very high-impact journal, the European Heart Journal, which showed uh, several changes that led to the development of the refined criteria whereby the green was what's normal, sinus bradycardia, first degree AV block, left ventricular hypertrophy, interpeat right bundle branch block. What's clearly abnormal, some things I've already told you, ST segment depression, T wave inversion, pathological Q waves, QT more than 470 or 480. And then we have this borderline category, where if you had left atrial enlargement, right atrial enlargement, left axis deviation, right axis deviation, we even included the black athlete T wave inversion V1 to V4 as a borderline. If you had more than one of these, then you went into the abnormal category. But if you had one of these on its own in someone who had no symptoms or no family history, we would regard these as, ab as normal. Now, based on this, the sensitivity for serious conditions went up to 100%. The specificity in white people was 94%, but still more work to do in black athletes. Still not as good as I would want it to be. Still 84% specificity. We want it more towards 95% for us to be really pleased that ECG screening may be a very good idea. And this works in adolescent athletes. This is data from Anil Malotra that's not been published yet. If we apply the refined criteria to adolescents, this is data based on over 10,000 athletes, you will find that your abnormal ECGs go down from 12.1% in white athletes to 2.8% um, with the refined criteria. In black athletes, they go down from 16.3% with the ESC to 3.8% in, uh, 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 in, in black athletes. And the specificity gets higher as you go from the ESC to the refined criteria. Of course, there are still discrepancies. T-wave inversion beyond V2. Um, Seattle say normal. We were saying maybe not normal. We had a less conservative QT interval, but we've re resol resolved all that. And for the sake of time, I would say to you that we would agree now that a QT interval of less than 320 is what should be considered for a short QT interval. That's what we should consider. And in, in terms of T-wave inversion, we also agree with the Seattle criteria. Again, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but this is data based on over 14,000 athletes, suggesting that in athletes, T-wave inversion, when it does occur, is usually confined only to V1 and V2 and rarely goes beyond V3. So we would only investigate T-wave inversion now in white athletes if it goes beyond V2, but not otherwise. So the journey so far from 2005 to 2014 is that there have been major developments in ECG criteria which have resulted in a significant reduction of false positive results without compromising specificity. And there, there are more data that will come out now. This, these data are, will be called the international recommendations for ECG screening and I hope this will be just one document for the whole world that will be published in the European Heart Journal sometime later on which looks a bit like this, and the only thing that you need to remember, it looks very much like the refined criteria, except that T-wave inversion in black athletes in V1 to V4 is considered as normal. We also include T-wave inversion in V1 and V2 as normal. And uh, finally, the juvenile ECG pattern in physically immature athletes aged under 16, uh, specifically T-wave inversion in V1 to V3, is also considered as normal. And if we apply this to our group of athletes today, if we went back and applied this, what would the results be? Because everyone wants to know, well, what would, you, what would happen if you then applied these criteria? So we did just this. If we apply the international criteria, our false positive rate in white athletes goes down to 2.4%. I think you'll all agree that's acceptable. Still, more work to be done. Only 5.7% in black athletes. So more work to be done on the black athletes ECG. There are concerns about false negatives. You have to all remember that the ECG will not pick up atherosclerotic coronary artery disease, coronary artery anomalies, and some incomplete expressions 
of cardiomyopathy. So EC, a normal ECG does not confer protection from an exercise related to sudden cardiac death. And there is also the issue of cost, which I'm not going to go into in detail. But just to say that if you apply the refined criteria to a large group of athletes, uh, this is over nearly 5,000 athletes, you would reduce your cost by 20% per condition diagnosed. And based on that, I'd like to conclude that pre-participation screening is recommended by many sporting organisations in the UK. The ECG is effective in detecting athletes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and many other cardiac diseases. Contemporary criteria, specifically the refined and Seattle criteria, are, are associated with a significantly lower false positive rate in white athletes. And the final take-home message, a normal ECG does not mean an athlete will not drop dead suddenly. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.